Close Horse is brought to you with support from the following sustainable brands. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Picnic wear, a slow fashion brand made by hand in New York City from vintage and dead stock textiles. Picnic wear strives for minimal waste, but maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Find Picnic wear on Instagram at Picnic wear, and that's where W-E-A-R, and at www.picnicwear.com. No flight back vintage, bringing fun new life to old things always using recycled and secondhand materials to make dope-ass shit for dope-ass people. See more on Instagram at No Flight Back Vintage. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room. All while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro-business. She's the one-woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one-woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made-to-measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Karen Kinney Studio. Located in western Massachusetts, Karen specializes in handcrafted earrings from found, upcycled, and repurposed fabrics, as well as other eco-friendly curios, all with a hint of nostalgia, a dollop of whimsy, a dash of color, and 100% fun. Karen is an artist slash designer who believes the materials we use matter. See more on Instagram at Karen Kinney Studio or online at www.cKinney.com. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. 
Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. Blank Cass or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. For the month of September, St. Evans is supporting the Lower East Side Girls Club, which connects young women and gender expansive youth of color throughout New York City to healthy and successful futures through free, innovative, year-round programming and mentoring. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens that's where saint evens country feedback is a mom and pop record shop in tarboro north carolina they specialize in used rock country and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares do you have used records you want to sell country feedback wants to buy them find us on instagram at country feedback vintage and vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar all are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at republica underscore unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that wants to normalize cutting open the tube of lotion or toothpaste or eye cream or concealer, whatever it is, and squeezing that last tiny bit of the contents into another vessel so you can get maximum use of everything you buy. I'm doing it. Are you doing it? These are all the things I'm thinking about this month as we talk about how nothing is disposable. And I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 97. Today's episode is part of a three-part series that will be filling out the rest of September. Once again, September's theme is nothing is disposable. And I am so excited about this group of episodes. 
I used the word excited so many times as I was writing my script to record this section that I had to go look for synonyms for excited on the internet. And all of them were kind of weird, actually. So I apologize in advance for telling you so many times in this episode how excited I am. But these episodes have literally been months in the making. My super special guest is Liz Ricketts, the director of the Orr Foundation, a USA and Ghana-based not-for-profit working at the intersection of environmental justice, education, and fashion development. And I am so thrilled there's a synonym for excited for all of you to meet her we we hit it off immediately i feel like we're old friends now and i feel so honored and so lucky that liz is another amazing person that i've gotten to meet talk with and and learn so much from we're gonna close horse has a lot of perks and meeting rad people is the number one perk today we're going to be talking about the incredibly unpretty truly disgusting truth about what happens to a vast majority of the clothing that we donate each year, that we stuff into trash bags and then dump off into bins that are conveniently placed to make throwing away our stuff as easy as possible. I know that sounds melodramatic, but it's the truth. Throwaway culture might not seem to be having an impact on you personally, other than that, you know, maybe you feel like you have too much stuff and it's kind of a burden, but the rapid cycle of shop, wear a couple of times or never, and then donate is having a massive negative impact on humans, animals, and the planet. It's just happening out of our line of sight. Liz is here today to put that in our sight, to explain, to share what's happening so we we can see it. Before we jump into my conversation with Liz, let's recap some of the facts that we know about our clothing. The average American buys, it depends who you ask, 68 to 70 new garments each year. We're talking brand new stuff, not secondhand. New stuff from the store, tag still on it. You know what I mean. That averages out to about a new item every five or six days. You're probably listening to this and you're saying, yeah, well, I haven't bought new clothes in years. I'm still wearing the same stuff from college or I exclusively thrift or wear vintage or sew my own clothes. And that is great. We need more of that, right? But that 68 to 70 number is an average. So it means that for every one of us who hasn't bought anything new in the past year, someone else bought 140 new items. That's how averages work, right? Zero plus 140 divided by two gets you to 70. That number is more like something new every two to three days. And of course, There are tons of people out there that land between that average of 70 and 140, but no matter how you slice it, this is a lot of clothing being created, sold, and then discarded. We've talked so much about how our clothes are made and how messed up it is, how unfair, how exploitive, how destructive, how wasteful it is. Today, we're going to talk about what happens on the other end of that cycle, As a reminder, 60% of clothing ends up in the landfill or the incinerator within the same year it was produced. When you hear that statistic, you know that a lot of that clothing just isn't being worn very many times, if at all. And we've all We've all done this, right? We've placed a huge order for this vacation or it's summer or, you know, we always feel obligated to buy a whole new wardrobe at the start of every season, which is so weird. You know, it's consumerism. And we've bought all this stuff. We've maybe returned some of it. We knew for sure that that was a no. We kept stuff that didn't make us feel our best, that really ended up being not that great when we actually wore it, but it was too late to return it. All of these things, it sits in our closet. We maybe wear it one more time. 
we reach a point where we just watched a Marie Kondo episode or we're bored at home or we can't find things in our closet, what do we do? We do a closet clean out, right? And ultimately, 85% of that clothing that we dispose of each year, regardless of how many times it's been worn or how much it cost or how we felt when we bought and wore it, 85% of that clothing ends up in a landfill or an incinerator. 85%. Like, definitely a majority there, right? The remaining 15% is donated. And donation's great, right? Because it fills us with a warm and fuzzy feeling. Yes, we overconsumed. We know it at least a little bit. We knew that when we looked at our closet. Yes, we barely wore that thing. And, you know, when we really think about it, it feels a little wasteful. Yes, we got rid of it because, you know, we overconsumed and our closet was bursting with things that we just didn't like that much and we hated the burden of it. We hated the chaos it created. We hated seeing it. But we donated it. So not only do we get the privilege of never thinking about it again, it's gone. It's deleted from our memories. Not only do we get to pretend that we never bought too much and wore it too little, but we also get to feel like we did a good thing by donating it. We get to feel like a hero, a philanthropist. Sounds so fancy, right? As we've talked about here on past episodes, at best, 10% of these clothes are actually sold by the thrift store where we drop them off. Of course, if we didn't drop them off at a thrift store and we used one of those bins that you find in like, I don't know, a Target parking lot, you know, my laundromat in LA actually had one right outside the door. Like you could be done doing laundry, look at something and be like, yeah, I'm not into this anymore and just jam it into the bin on your way out. Those bins that we've like that, that aren't attached to a thrift store or a thrift store name that we know, those clothes are never going to be worn locally. They're going to be sold off for shredding or shipped overseas. But of those clothes that we donated to an actual thrift store, once again, at best, 10% of those clothes are actually sold to another person locally, right? And it's important to say at best there because the statistics for it are all over the place depending on the thrift store, depending on the volume they're dealing with, the staffing they have, the customer base they have. 10% is the best case scenario. 10% of 15%. The reality is that we are cycling through so many clothes so rapidly that thrift stores can't keep up with the flow. When I see people being secretive about where they thrift because they want to keep that spot to themselves, or when I see, I see this so often, someone being a jerk on social media about resellers, I want to scream. It makes me so angry. I want to scream so loudly. Imagine I'm saying this in all caps, okay? Guess what? There's way more clothing being donated than we can ever possibly wear. So please, don't worry. We're not running out. There's plenty to go around. Because there is such an excess. And once again, this excess is overwhelming for thrift stores. And that's only 15% of the clothing we're tossing out every year, which is a very low percentage. I mean, imagine getting that grade on a test, handing the paper to your parents to sign, and it says 15% in thick red pen at the top, guess what? You're grounded. That mere 15% is so overwhelming for thrift stores because it's 15% of a huge number that the vast majority of all the clothes we donate will end up either shredded and used for industrial purposes or sent overseas. It's hard to get a gauge on the full scale of the global secondhand clothing industry because so much of it is conducted informally by individuals. Also, it relies on putting a value on this clothing that's not in line with the original value of the clothing. So it's really hard to say how many garments it really is and who's making how much money. People are getting rich off of it for sure. Plenty of other people are not. We do know that two to four million tons of secondhand clothing are being shipped from wealthier, more fast fashion consuming countries to 
poorer countries. No surprise here that the United States is the biggest exporter of secondhand clothing, followed by the UK. Liz and I are going to touch on this a lot more in our conversation, but this exported clothing is sorted by type, graded by quality, and bailed off before it heads across the world. And the better graded used clothing is exported to Central American countries, and the lower graded clothing is shipped to Africa and Asia. The biggest hubs for this commercial sorting, and once again, this is happening all over the place, but the biggest hubs are in South Asia, Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Hungary. My conversation with Liz is going to focus on Ghana and specifically the Contamanto market in Accra. But I can assure you that this deluge of unwanted clothing is flowing daily into other places as well. This story is repeating itself all over the world every day. This is the delusion of clothing recycling, the delusion of circularity playing out day after day. And this delusion is used by retailers to get us to consume more and more without guilt, blissfully unaware of the horrible repercussions of yet another Office 5KT that we only wore once because we had to for a photo and we never looked at it again, or that dress we wore to one wedding because of course you have to have a different dress for every wedding. All of that stuff we are being encouraged to buy and use with the delusion that it will be turned into something else somewhere down the road. The great news I have for you in the midst of all this bad news I just gave you is that after listening to my conversations with Liz and her team over the next few episodes, you will no longer be deluded. I'm definitely not. I'm angry right now, but I'm going through all the phases of grief. None of us will be deluded anymore. And this, I promise you, is how real change begins. It's by hearing the facts, learning the truth, seeing what's really going on. So let's just jump right in. Liz, why don't you tell everyone who you are and what you do? Hi, Amanda. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Liz Ricketts, and I am the co-founder and director of the Or Foundation. We are a nonprofit that's based both in Ghana and in the United States, working at the intersection of environmental justice, education, and fashion development. And specifically to this conversation, we've been working in solidarity with the Contamanto secondhand clothing market in Accra since 2016. Um, through a research project called Dead White Man's Clothes, which I'll explain, I'm sure, throughout this <laughs> conversation. And then um, now we're really working to address some of the findings of that research with the community, which again, I'll, I'll detail a little bit. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this. Um, it's I know that everybody who is listening is going to be, I mean, this is not a happy story, no. But it's a really important story, and I've touched on it on past episodes, and so many people reached out to me just like, oh, my God, how is it that more people don't know about this? Which is always the question, right? Absolutely. Um, so how did you get into this? How did you start the Or Foundation? Um, okay, so always a little bit of a hard question to answer, but – uh, my, I mean, my background is in fashion design, so I, I studied fashion design. I was actually just, um, I was sort of DMing and joking around with Aja Barber, who I'm sure most people listening to this know, she's amazing, about how mm-hmm. when I was in high school, the one detention I got for um, dress code is because I made my own back straps on my sandals, and the principal <laughs> went on the PA system, and he was like, you might think you're a fashion designer, but you're not. <laughs> we all, what? We must all <laughs> comply with this dress code. <laughs> and I feel like it was that day I decided I was going to go to school for fashion design and sh- really show him. But <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't anything super deep that led me into fashion, but I did always really care about personal style and, you know, was an artsy fartsy kid. But um I studied fashion design, and when working in the industry, you know, I saw the waste that existed on the production side. But for me, 
Well, that's not fair to say. So, you know, my entry point into sustainability within fashion very much was from a materials perspective at first. So I started Mm -hmm. upcycling. Um, I was working as a stylist and started upcycling gowns that were used on photo shoots um, because oftentimes, you know, you take like a $10,000 gown, someone wants to put it on the cover of Vogue, they put it in the ocean and it's ruined and never gets used again. (laughs) And I was like, that is (laughs) such a waste of so much. Um, and yep. so I would upcycle it and, you know, it would, it would be used again in different, um, formats and, you know, it was, it was a very rewarding entry point into sustain- sustainability and made a lot of sense, um, for my skill set and, and things that I cared about. But during that time, this is like 2005 to 2010. And it was during that time that the fashion industry ex- like accelerated at warp speed, right? And every part of the Mm -hmm. industry, no matter what segment you were in, started complying with the fast fashion model, started bending towards the rules that were being set by these large fast fashion companies. And I saw the impact that that had directly within my community of designers and creatives where people were turning to substance and alcohol abuse and just the very unhealthy, toxic work environments were taken to a completely new level. And, you know, people were attempting suicide. And, you know, I lost people that I cared about. And that's very serious and very alarming. And for me, you know, it it obviously just made me stop and think of if this is what's happening at the supposed top of this value chain you know the designer is a very aspirational role we grew up with project runway you know everyone wants to be a designer if that's what's happening there because of this shift towards you know fast fashion and consumerism and this in this sort of separation from creativity and the commodity of clothing then what in the world is happening throughout the rest of the value chain and so i started doing a lot of work you know trying to understand what was happening from you know field to shirt got really involved in politics around um, the cotton industry and garment worker rights. But there was always this one question that I really couldn't find any answers to, which was what happens to our clothes when we're done with them? Like we're obviously buying more than we can possibly wear. I have a closet just like everyone else. And there's a lot of clothing in it, (laughs) way way more (laughs) than I could possibly make use of. And you know, where does it go? What What is happening to it? And I, and I couldn't find any information. And so I started working with a lot of different companies that were saying that they wanted to improve the fashion industry. And one of those is a fair trade fashion company that was based both in New York and in Accra, Ghana. And it was co-founded by my partner, Branson, and a Ghanaian artist named Rom. And so my entry point into Ghana in 2010 was actually doing some upcycling with Rom in Accra for this clothing company. And that was also my entry point into Contamanto because we were going to the market and, um, you know, sourcing things for the upcycling project. And long story short, uh, we basically very quickly ended the clothing company because we also realized that making more clothes maybe wasn't what this movement needed or it wasn't, wasn't what made sense to us at the time. In part because of going to Contamanto, right? Contamanto is the largest secondhand clothing market in West Africa. It's probably the largest in the world. I'll talk more about it um, in a bit. But, you know, my I'm someone who really cares about clothing. And so going to a market where you're seeing piles of clothes, you know, on the floor, people walking on top of clothes, you just really start to understand that clothing as a commodity is just weight. Like it's just stuff that's being shuffled around the world and yeah. it's really really hard at that point to justify making more <laughs> of, of this stuff um yeah. and so we shift that's when we founded the or foundation and decided to focus more on education and specifically when we started we were focused very much on k-12 to education and trying to reach people young people before they you know, become consumers before they, you know, <laughs> you know, define themselves in that sort of role. So let's talk about Ghana for a second. Well, we we're going to talk about Ghana a lot. Um, for As a geography review for anyone who is like, I know Ghana, I know it's in Africa. 
that might be for a lot of people all they remember. Uh, Ghana is on the western side of Africa. Mm -hmm. It is on the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, especially Accra. It's on the uh, Gulf of, is it the Gulf of Ghana? Gulf of Guinea. Gulf of Guinea. And uh, it's a major port, right? Where a lot of our secondhand clothing is coming in. Ghana has kind of become this entry point, not only for clothing that circulates throughout the country, but also throughout the region. Um, So even if, you know, imports are illegal in surrounding countries, it travels over land borders um, once it makes its way to Ghana. So let's talk about being on the ground there at the market. How much clothing is coming in there? So in terms of how much clothing is coming in, we focus specifically on continental market because it's the pit stop, again, for clothing that's coming that is redistributed throughout the country and then also throughout the region. And so Contamanto sees 15 million garments a week. And the population of Ghana is just over, um, it's around 32 million people now. And so that's a lot of clothing. <laughs> and it's definitely too much clothing. And it's coming from all over the place, right? It's coming from the United States, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, and then also Korea are um, the main countries that are exporting. But it's really important for people to understand that clothing, the secondhand clothing trade is a supply chain that's very opaque to most of it. And it's, and it's a very complicated supply chain. So just like there's subcontracting, you know, in the firsthand supply chain, you hear about that all the time um, with factories, you know, subcontracting to other factories. And then when there's a disaster, that's why the brands say they're not responsible because they didn't actually contract with the subcontractors, right? My fave, yeah. <laughs> my fave excuse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's similar um, in the sense that clothing, so if you're in the United States listening to this, you might donate your clothing in the United States, but chances are those garments will make their way to another country, possibly multiple countries before they would make their way to somewhere like Ghana or somewhere else in the global south. Um, a lot of the clothing in the United States is sent to Canada for sorting and export. And then in Europe, um, different countries have different sort of specialities and what they do. And so, you know, a lot of clothing from France or Spain, for instance, might be collected there. And there might be like a pre-sort where they're sorting out some of the outright trash. But then most of it will go to, again, like the Netherlands or Germany to really be sorted into categories and ultimately exported to the Global South or to wherever its destination is. So, I mean, what is it like to be there? Because I'm trying to imagine a day when 15 million garments arrive. (laughs) Like, first off, I can't even envision that. Um, It must be just containers upon containers. It is. I mean, so first of all, the day... Um, starts very early. So the containers typically, so containers come into the country, they come into the port of Tema every day of the week. Um, but there's a specific day when they enter Consumanto. They all enter Consumanto on Thursdays. Thursdays is a market day for importers. And so all the containers come in on the same day and get unloaded on the same day and sold to retailers on the same day. So Thursday is like a there's a very specific vibe in the market and it's, it's a very intense sort of energy. Um, and it's, I mean, people start unloading their containers in the dark. Like if you really want to be there and like understand the process, you have to be there at like 2 a.m. Um, because that's when oh, they start wow. unloading the containers into the shops and they'll have, you know, a lot of times just using their phones as flashlights. And also there's, you know, sometimes, People are bringing in containers but don't want to pay, you know, the tax or something to the association. So they try to all unload, unload everything in the dark um, before it's light out so that they, their container can't be counted. There's some of that going on. But um, class. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, there's, I mean, container after container. I'm always astonished when I see taxis like trying to drive through this part of 
town um, in general, but certainly through Contamanso because they actually try to drive through. And I'm like, you're go- literally going to be here for the entire day. Like you cannot move. <laughs> like there's just piles, you know, if you get there, like typically I don't go at 2 a.m. I've been a couple of times, but typically I would go at like five or six. And even by then you have people who've actually already set up to sell And so you have these containers and like these big trucks and then you have piles of like bras and underwear and the truck (laughs) literally can't move because if it moved, it would run over like the piles of bra and underwear that are just like being sold right next to it. Um, So it's, I mean, you know, it it depends on (laughs) your tolerance for, for that kind of stuff. But for me, I, it's, a really beautiful energy like it can feel really hectic and overwhelming sometimes but there is I mean it's very organized you know I think if if you first enter maybe it's hard to gather what's going on um but it's very organized you know it's the same group of people that show up every Thursday to unload and yeah the bales get um sometimes people have pre-bought bales if they're like regular customers so that's mostly the retailers who have stalls in the market. They always buy the same type of bale. So, so just to clarify for listeners, like bales are defined by two categories. So one is the type of garment. So ladies tops, men's suits, et cetera. And then the other is the country of export. <clears throat> and the country of mm. export has a specific value assigned to it. Um, which I would say is both real and not so real. (laughs) So like the (laughs) bales from the UK are the most expensive because they're considered the highest quality, Um, which some people will tell you is because they have the least amount of trash in them. But from our research, it's actually the same (laughs) amount of trash. It's, so there is a little bit like of like actual trash. Yeah, actual like trash. Actual garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh my gosh. Bags or, okay. You know, or even just like a garment that's not supposed to be in there, like a boot gets thrown into like a t shirt veil or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also like a cachet that is related to colonialism, right? And like related to this mm-hmm. legacy of white supremacy where like the UK still carries this, you know. It just still carries this weight of of idealism and people and like desire, even though I don't think desire is the real wor- right word. You know, it's very manufactured desire, um, and so that also plays into you know why they're priced higher. But um, what was I saying? Okay, so the bales are unloaded, and mm-hmm. yeah, all of a sudden, like retailers, anyone who's purchased a bale is you know, lining up basically to um, to get their items. And they also hire women who are called kaie. Um, it's a term that means she who carries the burden. And they're female headquarters who transport these bales to and from the importers to the retailers. And then also just, you know, work throughout the market transporting the goods around. And these bales weigh 120 to 200 pounds each. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so it's very heavy. So typically their entire body weight or more oftentimes, you know, these girls can be as young as eight, typically in Contamanto, they're like 14 to 30 years old. Um, so their entire body weight or more, it's very heavy and they get paid very little. They get paid between 30 cents to a dollar um, per trip to transport the bail. And so on Thursdays when the clothing is coming in, like you really have to be conscientious you know, because like these bales are physically being moved while people are shopping or, you know, while you're visiting, mm-hmm. while you're working and, and they do fall. And you also just like really want to be considerate of the KIA working and make sure you're not stalling them because when they're walking through with the bales on their heads, the, mo- the most painful thing for them is to stop, right? Like they have to keep moving. Mm, yeah. And yeah. Um, maybe we can talk more about the KIA in a little bit, but yeah, the energy is very, um, it's very intense, right? And I would say each day has a very specific energy. Um, Wednesdays and Saturdays is market day for retailers. 
And so Contamanto is two sides. There's importer side and this is the retailer side and they're right next to each other. And on the retailer side of the market, there's 5,000 registered stalls inside. And then there's at least 5,000 sort of unregistered um, retailers who operate on the fringes of it and like sell in the streets. And every Wednesday and Saturday, retailers were open their bales that they bought on the Thursdays. And this is when I think it's um, the like there's the most anxiety in the market because retailers buy these bales without knowing what's in them, right? The bales are wrapped mm-hmm. in opaque plastic. It's highly compressed. They're purchasing anywhere from like 40 items for men's suits, for instance, to 800, 900 items of children's wear. And they have no idea wow. what the actual quality of the thing is, right? And mm-hmm. they're expensive. These bales, you know, anywhere typically from $120 to $500 a piece, um, which it, and that's USD. And oftentimes retailers are taking out loans, you know, to purchase them. And so the minute that they open the bail is just, it's a very difficult and anxiety ridden moment for them. Oftentimes the retailers, you know, they get there at 5 a.m. They sort of settle in and they get their bail delivered, to their stall, and they always pray before they open um, the bail. And once they open it, they immediately start sorting it into what they call selection. So in the Global North, we have different, you know, we have a sorting process and we have different methods of valorization and culture impacts that. And it's the same in Ghana, right? There's different ways of defining Mm -hmm. the value of something. And so they sort it into first, second, third, fourth selection. And first selection is the highest quality. And that's just, um, that's garments that look like they've barely been worn. Maybe they have the tags on them or really popular brands. And that only makes up around 18% of the average bale. And yet retailers will have to make back up to 90% of the cost of the bail off of that 18%. Wow. So that's interesting because like it, I think that most people would have the expectation that, which I, I know is untrue, <laughs> that these bales are being assembled with a certain level of care and consideration. But then you're like, oh, but you know, the British ones have the least amount of chip bags in them or whatever. It's like, oh, so actually it's super random and there are no guarantees and you could just end up with like a couple nice things and a bunch of chip bags. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's not a bunch of chip bags sometimes, but I mean, I think, <laughs> so I want to be fair in how I respond to that, which is that I think we also need to be, there's intense manual labor required to sort things and required on the collection right. side, right? And this is a whole other part of this conversation that also doesn't get talked about and that most people don't think about. And and I don't want to dissuade anyone from shopping secondhand. Please, please, please do not take that away from this conversation. But like a lot of people turn to shopping secondhand out of guilt of learning about what's happening in the fashion industry, right? And because Mm -hmm. we have this guilt sometimes we have blinders on when we go we go into this new space and we don't ask the same questions so we no longer are asking questions about the labor you know you're in a you're in a charity shop and you're not asking like who's the person who's working over there I wonder how much they're getting paid like who's Mm -hmm. the who's Mm -hmm. the boss that owns this you know like how much is he getting paid um we just stop asking questions about it. And that's a big problem um, because there are absolutely labor rights issues on the collection and sorting side. And I think that just like anything in the fashion industry, there are people who are doing the right thing and there are people who are not doing the right thing. Like there are some clothing mm-hmm. collectors and sorters who are very meticulous about how they grade the clothing. You know, sometimes they have upwards of 350 categories and they really are putting in a lot of effort to inspect the garments before they build them up. And then there's others that, you know, don't do that for whatever reason. (laughs) And so it's a mix. But I think that the larger issue is that we can't assume that we know what someone in Ghana is going to want, right? Like, I think there's always this, whenever I talk to people, 
there tends to be this suggestion or this reaction that like we could just improve it by improving sporting in the global north. Like if we could just only send quality things to Ghana, then it would be fine. But I think that Ghanaians have their own definitions of quality and they have their own like trends and their own definitions of beauty and, you know, all of that plays into it. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, some of it is, that it's not being sorted well, but a lot of it is also just, yeah, cultural differences. And I think too, Mm -hmm. I mean, let's also focus on the real problem, which is fast fashion. You know, like (laughs) the most of the clothing that we are donating today and that is going through this whole system is not being made to have many lives, right? It is not Mm -hmm. of quality. And, and that's really the largest, issue right like there there isn't enough for selection anymore there isn't enough high quality garments um oh totally i mean even here in the united states if you go to your standard thrift store a vast and i mean like well more than 90 percent of what you see there is going to be fast fashion yeah and that's the best stuff that came in right it's the other stuff that's going off to these textile recyclers to be bundled up and sent across the world exactly so they're already, they're, it's already like not the best version of already not great clothing that's making its way to Ghana. Exactly. Yeah. The It's called the cream. The cream gets sorted out in the global north and sold there. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of it, the, you know, quote unquote inferior products are what's exported. Yeah. And, but I think what's, you know, on, Back to thinking about market day. I, so there's the first selection, which is 18%, and then the third selection, which is around 46%. And third selection is like most of the stuff that we donate, right? It's the stuff that might have like a little stain or a little tear or the neck is a little um, stretched out, you know, And but it's stuff that people don't necessarily want um because mm-hmm. they don't necessarily want to look like they're wearing something that was worn by someone else but more so it's about the fact that there's so much coming to the market if there's 15 million garments coming to this market every week like that most consumers in ghana are going to want for selection like why would you not because you know like if you go to a retailer and they're out of first selection they only have third selection you're more likely to come back the next market day to get a fresh, you know, bail than you are to buy third selection because it's so obvious that it's a never ending supply of stuff. And that automatically like lowers the value, it lowers the price. And that has a, a, you know, a, an impact on what gets sold and on sort of the, the waste and disposability culture, but B makes it harder for the retailers to make their money back. Oh, totally. I just did a calculation. So if 15 million garments are coming in every week and only 18% of them are like this best quality, that's still 2.7 million garments every week. Yeah. So there's plenty of the best stuff to choose from. Unfortunately, that's, that's a very small amount of the total amount of clothing coming through and so I think that's where the crux of the problem is exactly. right exactly and it's completely changed the sort of again sort of perception of clothing right where you know Contamanto um is still to me the best example of like a sustainable marketplace it is the largest reuse and upcycling economy in the world most people going to Contamanto aren't going expecting to find you know, a garment right in their size, exactly as they want. People are looking for material to customize. And in Contamanto, you have basically the equivalent of multiple garment factories. And um, you have, you know, people cleaning clothes. You have people clipping threads, resizing clothes. Like you have tailors that can customize something however you want. Dyers, screen printers, cobblers, like everything that you need for a sustainable or, you know, circular system. Um, I mean, that part is amazing. Yeah. I wish we had that. I wish we had it too. North. We don't. And, but a lot of it also comes from like a deeper relationship with clothing. You know, most Ghanaians, like our team members, right, they've grown up 
taking cloth to a local tailor, having things tailor made and co-designing their clothes with the tailor. So there's this, you know, most people can sew in Ghana. Certainly most people can mend their own clothes, but there's also this relationship with clothing where, you know, everyone is comfortable on, with textiles. Like everyone understands how to talk about textiles. Everyone understands fit. Like everyone has a certain comfort level with construction of a garment and has a very good sense of what quality construction looks like. And so all of that, you have that, this culture and this mindset that people are coming into the market and shopping with. And then you also have the skill set in the market that enables all of that. And it's absolutely beautiful. But what is so tragic is that because there's so much excess just literally flooding this market, of course, it's teaching people that clothing is disposable. It's changing that Uh, mindset. It's priming people, you know, for fast fashion consumption because that's what we're saying to them, right? Like, like we're literally dumping our clothes on them. We're dumping cheap things that aren't well made and, and you, you know, if you see that around you all the time and you see this market with this never ending like flow of products, of course you're going to start to change the way you think of fashion. And that's to me, yeah, the scariest part, honestly. And a very important thing for people to pay attention to because I find that that's the biggest argument people use um, be, when they're pro, like secondhand clothing exports, is that they'll say, you know, it's good that we're sending our clothes to Ghana because it will stop companies like H&M from coming to Ghana. And I'm like, it's, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> but it's, actually, it's truly the opposite. Because... First of all, most of the garments that are coming to Ghana are H&M and similar brands. They are creating brand familiarity, but then you're also priming people to think of clothing as a cheap commodity that is disposable. And so now you do have more people in Ghana that are craving fast fashion. You have ASOS like targeting them with massive ads like all the time. And these brands are coming there now. Honestly, if, if, if it's still hard for someone who's hearing this to believe that being just exposed to a constant flood of cheap clothing makes you devalue clothing and want more clothing, I mean, that's what's happened to all of us. Exactly. I definitely remember a time in my life where I had very little clothing and what I had was all extremely valuable to me. And then there was a shift where, I mean, I remember the first time I went to a Forever 21 and came out with a whole bag of clothing and spent like 50 bucks and was like, I can't believe I just got eight garments or something for $50. This is crazy. And at first it was very novel. And then it became just the status quo that like, of course, if you were doing something this weekend, you would go buy a new outfit just for that. And you know, it didn't matter if you never wore it again or someone spilled a beer all over you or the zipper started to break because you spent such a little money for it. And it filled us with this delusion of disposability that these clothes could just go away. And they don't. I have been more and more using this noun, which is the delusion of clothing recycling, right? Because that's what we're talking about right now. Lots of retailers are selling us, some more than others, this delusion that when we're done with our clothes, if we give them to them or we donate them, that they're somehow being turned into new clothes or they're all definitely being worn by another person. I mean, take a step back and think about that. If it's fast fashion stuff that when you bought it, you knew you were only going to wear a couple of times, what actual wear and value is left in that Exactly. Yeah. I remember when we first talked, we were talking about yeah, changing greenwashing to delusion washing. <laughs> what <laughs> yes. it is. Washing us I mean, delusion. But so it much, is. It's just this compounding cognitive dissonance, right? I mean, sometimes for me, it's so fascinating when people, like pe- most people drop off their clothing in a garbage bag, right? Like if they're donating clothing to a local yeah. charity, they literally put it in a garbage bag. A lot of times don't wash it and they drop it off with no real attention to the people who are there to sort it and hang it up and handle it. And most people who drop off clothing and donate don't buy from the same places that they donate to, which is part of the problem, right? Like if we're always Mm -hmm. offloading Mm -hmm. the old and buying new, then yeah, that doesn't make for a very good (laughs) good circular system, does it? Um, 
but yeah, but then at the same time, it's like you're dropping stuff off in a garbage bag, but then in your mind, you're thinking, because you've been told this over and over again, you're thinking that you're like literally saving someone's life with this garment. Yeah, no, it's true. It sounds like so dramatic, but it's true. That is what people have been taught. Yeah, that you are just, you are doing this like amazing good deed. I always think back to include, have you ever seen Clueless? Yeah. Okay. So at the end of Clueless, you know, we have this whole like redemption arc and um, why am I blanking (laughs) on the Cher, the main character? She is doing this like collection of, you know, donated stuff for people who, I I don't know, people who lost their homes. There was a fire, an earthquake. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. And like people are donating skis and bongs and things like that. And they're like, you know, it's filling (laughs) them with these good vibes. And it's like, actually what these people need are probably like kitchen utensils and a place to live and bedding and, you know, like And just money. Yeah. And most importantly, money. They just need money. (laughs) Yeah. And instead we're like giving (laughs) them bongs and skis. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I feel like that's where we are with donation. You know, as you were talking about, I mean, something I had not even, I mean, I knew this, but like hadn't really thought about it was that most of the people who are donating are not the people who are shopping secondhand. And so once again, we go back to this delusion of circularity that a lot of retailers are trying to sell us. If that were real, the people who are like, you know, sharing the secondhand clothes, whether they're donating or selling or whatever, would be a part of a circle, right? And they would also be the customers exactly. at some point. But really, in most cases, we're just looking at a line. A line yep. that is buy, dispose, buy some more, dispose, and just keeps going on into infinity, but it never connects back into a circle at any point. Exactly. And I would love, I haven't seen any data around this, I would love to see what percentage of people who donate clothes are also like thrift shoppers because I feel like it would be a, a huge gap. You know, and I know there are people who are listening who are like, I do both, and that's great, but that is not the vast majority at all. Yeah, it's a specific audience that's finding this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's not to, I mean, I'm, yeah, I don't want to be too critical because, again, I think it's, there's so many myths that have been fed to people, right? Even just like the idea of the deficit myth. Like, there's literally this idea that we have been taught in the global north that. There's too much stuff in the global north, but that's okay because there's not enough stuff in the global south. And so all we have to do is move the stuff, right? Like that is something that we have actually been taught, but that's not true. Like there aren't people in the global south that actually need our clothes. Like there, I mean, there's a small segment of people everywhere in the world who are mm-hmm. going through crisis, who are experiencing houselessness, who do need that kind of support. But it's not in the way that it has been marketed to people with, you know, the stereotypical image of like a kid without shoes in, uh, you know, in some nameless African country that's been put on some clothing bin. Um, And we really need to question that, right? Like we need to question and really take the time to reflect on why we haven't been more critical um, about those narratives and, you know, why we haven't, um, naturally been questioning them for a long time but something you were saying oh yes about the circle um and I I I love that you said that I think it's so important to talk about these take back programs and to talk about how it's really just kind of prolonging the linear economy it's not actually creating a circular economy because this is something people really need to be paying attention to right where The clothing take back program, some of the resale programs that brands are starting to me, it's not about solving the problem. It's about them extracting more profit from the stuff they already made or more profit from the problem. 100%. So I just released an episode about all kinds of secondhand stuff, but I looked at ThreadUp. I finally, I think Mm -hmm. I had mentioned this to you before. I was like, I need to figure out what's going on there. And (laughs) it was a lot of work. It was a lot of digging. But basically, you know, ThreadUp is getting, I want to say, I want to say like 15 million garments a year. Let's just say that's the number. Only 40% of them actually get sold to customers like on their website. That's not enough. When you're selling secondhand clothes and you've had to like, 
shoot them one by one, steam them, you know, make sure they look good, edit the photos, write the copy, all that stuff. That's a very low profit game. So how is ThreadUp? I want to say they made $128 million in profit last year in a year that was really bad for retailers. Uh, How are they making all that money? Well, it's because they are extracting every bit of profit they can get out of the other stuff that you gave them that they're never going to sell on their website. So yeah. they're selling this stuff off much in the same way H&M would when you bring in their clo- your clothes and get that, like, what is it, like a 10% discount? I don't even know. I don't remember what they give anymore. But yeah, I mean, I don't even know if people listening to this know that, right? That when you put stuff in the, the bin, it usually says recycling on it. <laughs> the, the bin and the H&M stores and other stores that partner with ICO. Um, most people think that that's being recycled by H&M, like back into their product, but actually it's just, most of it's just being exported (laughs) and it's funneled right into the secondhand clothing trade. Totally. There's not like a magic machine. And this is what I hate about, I mean, there are other brands that do this too, but to me, H&M is the most egregious because it's like the biggest, I guess, and the most well-known, um, They're bringing this delusion of recycling clothing to, you know, middle America, right? And basically, it creates this illusion that a dump truck backs up to a huge building, right? And it dumps all those clothes that everybody put in the bin at H&M in there. And there's like all kinds of machines and like steam comes out of the roof. And then at the end, just out plops a roll of fabric or like some already recycled clothing. And it's like, dude, that that doesn't exist like period like <laughs> no and i mean we haven't even gotten into the waste from contamanto but basically so i'll say that first so contamanto again sees 15 million garments a week and what we found is that 40 percent leave as waste and i'll we can go into that more percent. but now that we're talking about h&m yes 40 percent leaves as waste but now we're talking about h&m there i want everyone to listen to this very carefully which is that H&M, you know, just installed their loop recycling machine in one of their stores. Um, and, you know, it was promoted widely on the internet that they're doing garment to garment recycling and people can bring in their clothes and turn them into new clothes. That machine would take 50,000 years to recycle one week's worth of waste from Continento. Wow. Wow. I mean, that right yeah. there, I, so as you're talking, I did some calculations here. So 40% of that 15 million that's coming in every week is trash, right? That's yeah. 6 million garments every week. Um, yeah. I'm just pretending that for sure that's coming in every single week of the year. That gets you to 312 million garments every year that are yeah. coming into one port in one country on one continent because our secondhand clothes are being shipped all over the place, let me assure you, that yeah. is just straight up garbage, right? Like no one's ever going to wear this again. And it's not going to be turned Correct. into something else. It's not going to – H&M's not going to put it in its magic machine and turn it into no. like going out tops. Like this this is it. What happens to those 312 million garments? Yes, what happens? So, so the 40% – is handled in two ways. So one is formally and one is informally. Informally just means that it's handled by the government and informally is that it's handled by individuals um, in the informal marketplace. So formally, well, first of all, let's also focus on the fact that Contamanto is the largest consolidated point of waste for all of Accra and possibly for all of Ghana, wow. which is very profound when you consider that that's you know, clothing that's coming from other countries. And again, we said, you know, of the 15 million garments coming in every week, around 40% leave as waste. And that's often within one to two weeks of landing at port. So again, because of what I was saying around the first selection and third selection and this, you know, just the constant flow of goods, lowering the cost of everything, you know, it's, it's a very fast, like, pit stop that this clothing makes. Um, one to two weeks, that's it. And so the local government, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, was picking up 70 tons of clothing waste every single day from Contamanto, and they were trucking it to a sanitary landfill called Pone, um, which 
you know, coincidentally is very near the um, harbor where the clothing comes in. And Pone was a landfill that was built financed by the World Bank. It was built to last over eight years, but it filled up in just over four years, mostly because of the secondhand clothing waste. Because, of course, when they were constructing this landfill, they were using data based off of local waste generation. And they weren't thinking about foreign waste. Like, why, why, why would they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they didn't account for that in, um, in constructing the landfill. And so what ended up happening is that so much clothing waste was coming to this landfill that it overflowed and it completely sort of um, um, compromised the systems in the landfill in terms of, you know, daily cover, um, making sure everything is compressed. And it essentially created this toxic cap on the landfill that led it to explode. So in August of 2019, Uh, I happened to be there that day and I showed up and the landfill was on fire, like a big fire. It it was exploding on multiple parts of the landfill and it has been unusable since they just capped it. And this fire, you know, being there and seeing the waste pickers who work there, so there's a waste pickers association called the Pone Waste Pickers Association. It's over 500 members, and they do an incredible job of recovering waste from the dump site. Sometimes upwards of 30% of the waste that's delivered there, they're recovering and putting back into the system for reuse and recycling. But they're not recovering clothing waste. The clothing waste has no value <laughs> because there is, again, it's already been there to be reused and no one wanted it, and there is no recycling as we've established. So what they're recovering is typically, you know, water bottles, um, wire, um, you know, aluminum, things like that. And the clothing waste is just a nuisance for them. Like it, it just gets in their way and makes it harder for them to recover the things that do have value. It also makes their life more dangerous. It wraps around their ankles. It causes them to trip. It creates these sort of sinkholes throughout the landfill. And this can be really dangerous. Like if they fall, they fall on, on sharp objects. You know, there's medical waste that's kind of mixed in throughout the dump site. You have to be really careful. Sometimes they fall and get injured because they fall on something, you know, sharp. And other times they fall and, you know, the compactor truck runs over their leg or worse um, because it doesn't see them, right? Mm-hmm. And these are the impacts of the clothing waste that I think, you know, most people aren't really aware of. Um, so then to see when the fire happened, the Waste Pickers Association, they were still there. They were working. Like the landfill was on fire. It was advancing across the, like it started in one quadrant and was quickly advancing across the entire thing. And the Waste Pickers were still working desperately to sort of get their piles of stuff that they had recovered, their bags of, you know, plastic bottles and roll them down the hill so that they could, you know, make money off of it and survive and seeing that just really it's really you know I mean it's it's both humbling and it's shocking it's you know this is it's such dangerous labor and to imagine that people are risking their lives to recover plastic bottles which are things that most of us you know can't be bothered to recycle ourselves Mm -hmm. um it's just, yeah, it's, it's really unfair and, um, I mean, it's infuriating. And then on top of that, the plastic bottles that most of them are recovering are exported to the Global North to be turned into recycled PET textiles, um, which has a lot of other issues in terms of microfiber yeah. release. Um, but also, again, it's just important for people to realize it because this is the supply chain of like a lot of recycled products because a lot of recycled products are extracting raw resources from places in the global South. And because the circular economy, all of this stuff is new. Again, there's not the scrutiny. There isn't the oversight. There isn't this conversation about labor rights. Mm-hmm. And most people would never think that their recycled PET top, <laughs> you know, is made with water bottles that were extracted from a burning landfill in Ghana. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's, that's the situation and it's important for us to pay attention to 
when we're, you know, engaging with brands and thinking about, again, sort of the delusion marketing around circularity and recycling. So the landfill is on fire. It's no longer usable. Um, so the government still is picking up the waste, but they're mostly sending it to open quarries or to informal dump sites that are being managed by the government. So essentially to sites that are more harmful for the in environment because they don't have the kind of protections that stops, you know, the, the leachage and, you know, the chemicals and the runoff and all that stuff from going into the soil and into the environment. But then a lot of the clothing waste was never handled formally because the government doesn't have enough trucks. It doesn't have enough funding to pick it all up. And so that 70 tons that the government was picking up every day is actually just uh, one third to half of the clothing waste that's generated every day. The rest of it is being handled informally. And what that means is basically three things. So one is that there's burn piles throughout the market. So there's like specific parts in the market where every day, you know, thousands of shoes, thousands of garments are piled up and lit on fire. Oh my God. That is not extremely stuff. Toxic. Yeah. That is not stuff that should be burning just to be clear for everyone. One of our neighbors out here tried to burn their couch and I'm still mad at them about it. Um, like yeah. these are not things that should ever be burned. Yeah. It's very, very toxic. Um, and there's, you know, people who are hired to stand there and manage it and they're just breathing all of that in. And then a lot of the clothing waste is kind of just swept into the open gutter system um, where it causes all sorts of problems <laughs> because, you know, first of all, when it's in the open gutter system, it wraps around itself, it clogs the gutter. And then when there's rain, it leads to increased flooding, which then leads to increased, you know, risk of cholera and malaria and other diseases. And eventually this clothing will make its way out to sea. But by the time it's done that, it's basically like entangled itself with a bunch of plastic and metal and soaked up all sorts of like human and industrial excrements, like literally was in the sewer system uh -huh. and then gets pushed out to sea. And when it gets pushed out to sea, it's in the form of these long tentacles. So, I mean, we call them tentacles, but that, to me, what they look like and how they move, but basically they can be anywhere from, you know, typically eight feet to 30 feet long, typically three feet in diameter. And again, it's like picture, you know, when you put too much clothing in your washing machine and it, you know, tangles itself up, it's, it's like that, but on steroids. And again, it has all sorts of other stuff entangled in it. And, you know, parts of the clothing have decomposed, but other parts are still there. And it's just these wild objects that really have a mind of their own. So they go back and forth, like with the current and they cause all sorts of problems for fishermen because they get caught in their motors. Um, they weigh down their nets. We were talking to a fisherman a couple of months ago who almost capsized because one of these tentacles like got tangled at the bottom of his net and he physically couldn't pull it back up. Right. And all of this makes their job more dangerous. These are mostly the fisher, the fishing communities they work with are mostly, um, well, they all are artisanal canoe fishing, um, communities. So very sustainable. Um, but it's already one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. And what this means is that they have to go further out to sea because the clothing has destroyed the marine ecosystem that they relied on for fish. But then also because again, these sort of tentacles are literally like running into their boats and, and threatening their livelihood. So they have to go further out to sea, which again makes their job even more dangerous. But eventually a lot of this clothing washes up on sea and you know, we're talking millions of garments and the, the local community, you know, they clean their own beaches, they'll pick it up, but then there's nowhere for it to go. So it just gets burned. And during holidays is really when you can get a sense of how much clothing it is because people are on holiday. So they're not cleaning the beach every day. And, you know, after just four days, it's just, I mean, the entire beach is covered in mounds of clothing and you end up with this like clothing soup in the water. Oh. It's terrifying. And then the only thing that we can assume, you know, we don't know for sure, but a lot of these clothing tentacles 
appear to be sinking to the bottom of the ocean. Like it would make no sense that they're not, <laughs> you know, they're very heavy. They get pushed out to sea. And so we really believe, believe that like what we're able to document on the shore is, is a tiny fraction of what's sitting on the sea floor. And that's very terrifying. Um, and then a lot of the clothing race also goes to informal settlements. So Near Contabanto, there's um, a few different communities. We work with one um, in an informal settlement called Old Fatima, um, where it's around 80,000 to 160,000 people. It's a migratory population. And a lot of the clothing waste is picked up by individuals carried, you know, on their heads or transported on a small trolley to these dump sites that are typically right along the waterway. Um, there's a lagoon right there. And there was a dump site, uh, well, there is a dump site that we work at frequently. And when we first started working there, it was around 30 feet tall and 60% clothing waste. But in the last year since I've been back, um, I would say it's at least 50 feet tall, probably 60 feet. And still, you know, 60% clothing waste. Like, it's really the clothing waste that's kind of holding the whole thing together. And it's growing so much that they have to burn one face of the dump site um, because it's the only way, you know, to make more space to put more trash. And this, the informal dumping is, to me, the most violent aspect of it because this waste... <sighs> Because it's dumped in communities where, you know, some of the most vulnerable citizens in Ghana live, um, mm -hmm. it's very easy for that to then be blamed on those people, right? And, and this mm -hmm. waste is in their backyards. It's where their children play. It's where their cattle graze. It's, you know, this is not waste that they created. It is waste that they have to figure out how to survive and how to live with. But still you know, it is used basically um, to further disenfranchise them, to blame them for creating the problem. And then that's used politically to dispossess them of their land, to literally bulldoze their homes. Um, and to me, you know, that's, that's the real aspect of waste colonialism that I think a lot of people don't know so much about of, of like of course there's the initial dumping and exportation of the waste but then it's also this further cultural erasure and like dispossession of land um that is very very violent to me um yeah i mean it's it's like take a step back you just gave us a whole lot of information right like let's just review here so these clothes uh they made the landfill catch on fire so now it's capped so now we have clothes being dumped into quarries and other just sort of holes in the ground where there are not they're not lined you know a landfill is usually yeah. lined what it's lined with i can't specifically say but it's lined to prevent the breaking down of all these chemicals leaching into the soil into the water so people who yeah. are living there are automatically going to see if they're not already seeing this the effects of this clothing in their soil and water we have people exactly. burning these clothes, which means it's getting into the air and no doubt causing all kinds of respiratory issues. And I would assume, you know, affecting everyone's health in a wide variety of ways that aren't immediate. We have these clothes yeah. ending up in the ocean where they are making it, it's making it more dangerous for fishermen to do their job. Uh, it's yeah. also getting little bits of plastic into fish, which people are eating. And ultimately the stuff is ending at the bottom of the ocean. And I don't even want to think about what happens then because that's extra scary. And then also just like we're looking at piles of garbage that are four or five stories tall, just clothes, just out there, you know? And I, if you, if though, if, if envisioning all of that doesn't make you see the repercussions that, fast fashion and as it is right now and even these like delusions of circularity that were being sold i don't know what will because for the people of ghana and so many other countries around the world our trash is making them sick it's affecting generation upon generation it's hurting the animals no doubt it's hurting the ability to engage in agriculture i mean it's yep 
it's so bad. This is like waste colonialism. It's yep. so disgusting. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's part of cultural erasure and sort of, ad, uh, again, advancing a colonial agenda because it's not even just what goes to waste. It's also, again, the sort of cheapening and the spreading of disposability culture. And, you know, half of our team are designers. And I know you're going to speak with them more in depth about this. But, you know, local designers cannot compete with this industry. And, no you know, way. It's, it's, the, the clothing is basically free. And, and so it's completely upending, it's upending anything um, sort of traditional um, and replacing it with stuff from outside. And it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very violent. Uh, and I know it's overwhelming for people to hear. It, it is, it is. But I, but I think it's very essential for us to face, right? I mean, the first time I learned about all of this, it was definitely like I I need to take a moment, right? I mean, I worked in the industry for a really long time. I was a part of the machine that created a lot of this stuff. And yet I will tell you, not only do the people who are buying these clothes not know that this exists, a vast majority of the people working in the industry to make those clothes have no idea either. Think about all of the yep. workers in China or Bangladesh or anywhere where a lot of garments are being made. These people are working under oppressive conditions, being paid little to nothing, facing all kinds of abuse. All of this blood and sweat and sacrifice going to make these shitty clothes that end up making tentacles in the ocean. I mean, that is that is the least yeah. cute, least stylish thing I've ever heard. And I think it's really important for us to always take a step back and, and see that, that like Maybe what we think is so cute or, you know, going to make us look so good on Instagram is kind of ugly. Not even kind of, yeah. is ugly. You know, and I think it's very ugly. that's another really, you touched on something else that is really important to remind everyone here is that we're not doing anyone any favors by sending our fast fashion clothes to say Ghana, where previously people actually made, designed and sewed and tailored clothing. It was an industry that no longer exists there. And so now the jobs that you can do there to support your family are like collecting bottles or carrying heavy bundles of clothing on your head through the market. I mean, like this is destroying an entire society. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, I mean, it's turning more of the world into a corporate colony. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's dark, but, but true. Right. Right. Like it's, it's weird because <laughs> it is true. because like I, you know, I, Every once in a while, someone will reach out and be like, listen, I really wanted to listen to your podcast, but I'm like tired of hearing about it. I'm tired of hearing about fast fashion. Like, I don't want to feel bad about what I'm buying. And I mean, at the core of it is like, sorry, like this, this stuff, that clothing that we think is just like a trifle that doesn't matter, that comes in and out of our lives. Like, it's more important how we look than like how we feel about what we're wearing at I hear these kinds of things. I hear people saying, like, I don't want to hear about it anymore. It's depressing. And I'm like, dude, this is real. It's mm -hmm. not like a fun – like a like a, a spooky story that I'm telling you. And I think that it really means all of us taking a step back and thinking a lot, a lot yeah, about not only our actions, but also, like, I mean – Seriously, you should be mad at H and M. You should, everyone should be raising hell at H and M for selling the delusion that our clothes are being recycled into more clothes. Well, that's what I was going to say too. I think it's if you're tired of hearing. I mean, first of all, I totally empathize with that perspective, and I think that the consumer in the global north has. Like the problem is that the consumer in the global north is like the common denominator between you know, the garment worker and people making our clothes and, you know, folks in Contramanto who are dealing with the waste. And the issue is that the consumer has too much power or too much perceived power mm -hmm. um, within this scenario. And we have to figure out how to give it away. We have to figure out how to redistribute power and redistribute wealth so that, you know, the, the garment worker and the retailer in Contramanto can 
you know, have some more autonomy, can make decisions about what they want for their own lives, right? Yeah. But I think that the thing I would say to anyone who is tired of hearing about this is that, okay, you know, if you, if you don't want to listen to more information about, you know, the reality of what's happening with the fashion industry, then also do whatever you can not to receive advertisements from fashion companies. Because I think, unfortunately, the issue is that we're inundated on a daily basis with stuff that makes us forget what it is that we're talking about right now Mm -hmm. with stuff that makes us comfortable and, you know, makes us feel like it's not that big of a deal. I'll just buy this thing. Yeah. And so if we're going to turn off, you know, the the sort of darker conversations, then we also need to turn off. (laughs) We also need to put a, put a literal plug in, you know, the marketing and the things that are telling us that it's okay to keep consuming. And that's just really hard to do. And I, I do, to, again, like I totally empathize, but unfortunately I feel like we need to keep talking about it because we have this, you know, other people with massive marketing budgets <laughs> that are making themselves heard in our lives every single day in ways that we aren't even fully conscious of a lot of times. Absolutely. And so if we don't remind ourselves what's going on, then we get carried away into the delusion ourselves. Exactly. Exactly. Because there is, we're hearing a lot more noise that continue, that like perpetuates the illusion than we are people shouting about like this darker, uglier side of it, right? Like it's always there at least at this point, they're so much louder than us. Like that, that it, yep. because money talks, right? And we, no, exactly. no one wants to, you know, throw their money at this problem right now. I was reading a really depressing article. It's actually from a year ago, but just somehow ma- made its way to me about basically how no one is paying to fund research into the climate impact and envi- like in just total environmental yeah. impact of the fashion industry. Why? Because the people who are interested in doing that and and gathering that information, like say us, we don't have the money for that. The people who do have the money to fund research that they're interested in are H&M and Nike and Zara. And so they are putting their money into things that they can kind of spin to work for them. And so like when you look at say an H&M conscious collection and you start to read some of their claims – I mean, they have, they have, they have supported the research that makes claims that using exactly. polyester is better for the planet. They, like, there yep. has been sketchy data around that. Well, and when they fund people, they have, like, very specific contracts. Exactly, and they can't exactly. Negative around them. So basically, like, there's data being collected on the fashion industry solely for use in greenwashing, basically. And so, like, even the statistics that you might hear from me or, you know, Remake or any of the other players out there in sustainability or, you know, shouting about human rights and the planet and its relationship to the stuff we buy, it's limited. It's why you kind of hear the same statistics over and over again because no one wants to fund it. Yeah. It's not a sexy story. I mean, you know, you could go course. way down the rabbit hole, but even like when we think about like, you know, illnesses – and conditions that get a lot of medical research thrown at them, it's always because there's like a cash grab at the end of it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there'll be a drug that like a pharmaceutical company can make a fortune off of. And unfortunately, there's no one who makes a dollar off of telling us that we're buying too much stuff. You know, like it's it's, exactly. not, it's not a cute story. The polyester thing is something that's really been on my mind lately because – Uh, There was just a report that came out, actually, I think last week, uh, by Changing Markets, I believe. Uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was basically like a vast majority of the environmental conscious sustainability claims that the biggest retailers are making is greenwashing. And I don't think that surprises you or me. But a big chunk of that greenwashing is actually around polyester and recycled polyester. Yep. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, I I knew that on a surface level, right? We just unwrapped the the delusion of recycling, but uh, it's interesting to see how like places like Zara or H and M have been really glomming on to research that says 
and it's totally, it's, it's not good research, that polyester is better for the planet than cotton, that yep. poly, recycled polyester is better than anything. And the reality is like, these are just, it's almost like creating data so that you can continue to sell as much stuff as possible. It's not a, exactly. It, if if H and M was really concerned about sustainability, they would say, you know what, we're going to make clothes that last longer. They're going to be more expensive, but exactly. you're going to get years and years and wear out of them. We're going to have repair workshops in our stores. We're going to pay living wages to all of our workers. We're going to encourage you to buy less clothing. We're going to show yep. you how to style it to make it more relevant. We're never going to send you an email that says you need a new dress for every wedding you went to this summer. Yep. Or have you thought about doing some retail therapy, <laughs> you know? Exactly. They would stop talking about it as if it's a human right. Like stop talking about convenience as if it's a human right or even personal expression as a human right. I mean, you know, I love style as much as the next person, but like we really need to, we need to take a step back and remember that like, yes, clothing ourselves is a necessity, like protecting our physical being from the elements, but like fashion is not actually a necessity. <laughs> and no, no. We are, we continue to treat it as if it is and like come up with all of these layers of justification um, to yeah, continue making and selling more and more and more and more and more stuff. But access to convenience, being able to get whatever you want whenever you want is actually not a human right. Like it's, it is not. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm laughing because to us. I've definitely heard like people really say exactly people otherwise. That. Yeah, yeah. It's I know. Like, it, it's so weird, right? Like I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's astonishing. Um, I know, I know. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Convenience can be really nice, right? Like it's nice when you yeah. can just open your refrigerator and dinner's already there and you just have to heat it up. That's very convenient, right? Yeah, but that's it's, dinner. Yeah, I know. It's not like clothes Food arriving is at your door every day. human need. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think I have been thinking a lot about how, why greenwashing is so successful. Because if you... The thing is, like, if you have any awareness of what greenwashing is and you can spot it, uh, it's really obvious immediately. Like, it just takes a little bit of practice and then you're like, oh, yeah, that's like scam, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the real reason that greenwashing is successful is because no one – not no one – many people are afraid of change, of change and they're afraid of changing – what they've been doing for a really long time. They're yep. scared of like, wait, I can't just have all the clothes I want whenever I want. I can't buy something on my lunch because I'm having a bad day. I can't wear a new outfit every time I go on a Tinder date. Like that's <laughs> that's the core, right? So a lot of conversations I'll see around say resale or which I mean, I I think resale is the future, and it needs to just be easier and better, and you know, more environmentally friendly in a variety of ways. But a lot of the conversations I see about around resale or rental are really about not about doing truly the best job of making clothing more sustainable, but really about making it guilt free to not change your your habits. So exactly. like rental, you know. Rental on the surface sounds like a really great idea. Like if you need a suit to wear for a job interview or something to wear for a wedding or you need maternity clothes, rental makes a lot of sense because you could yeah. – in theory, it's like a library and you check it out and you wear it and then you send it exactly. back. But unfortunately, that's not where rental is right now. Rental has more and more pushed into this idea that you should have new clothes all the time. And that's what it's selling you. It's selling you constant guilt-free newness. But it's also behind the scenes, it's like tons of clothes are getting wasted. They're all fast fashion clothes in the first place. The carbon footprint yeah. of shipping back and forth, the plastic, the packaging, the human rights of the whole thing, you know, the the dry cleaning chemicals, the washing, the water, like it's it's not it's not a great story. But no, no one's digging that hard into but it. But it's a because good distraction. It you is. Know, if we exactly. weren't distracted by being able to buy things that make us feel better, we'd have to confront the fact that 
most of us don't treat one another very well. And there are very serious, very difficult like problems out there um, that take commitment, that take like actual work and that take confrontation. You know, like most people don't are, you know, don't enjoy conflict, don't engage, you know, don't enjoy engaging in difficult conversations. And I think being able to shop, you know, the idea of retail therapy, you know, convincing yourself that just as you said, you know, you can get something new, but if it's rented, it's fine. Um, It's just a big distraction. And I think ultimately I really believe that we're not so afraid of, destruction and you know tragedy and all of those sort of horrible things I think that we're deeply afraid of what we're capable of I think we are deeply afraid of what we are capable of if we decide to trust one another if we decide to you know choose community over competition Mm -hmm. um I think we are we are deeply afraid of it and I think that stops a lot of us from making like true you know making changes in our life that are truly holistic and revolutionary. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it leads to just the sense of like, well, I give up because Mm -hmm. it's too big for me to confront. It's too difficult. There aren't enough people involved. It's hard to see what the win is, like that kind of thinking. I mean, I think we are raised to be competitive, whether we like it or not. And I think that's a lot for people to unpack that maybe life doesn't have to be about winners and losers. But unfortunately right now, there are infinitely more losers than winners. Exactly. And if you think you're winning, you're probably not. I I mean, that's like <laughs> – I know that sounds like conspiracy theorist. But trust me, if you live on this planet, you're probably not winning right now. <laughs> Can I just say how excited I am to continue this conversation with Liz? She'll be back next week for the second half of our conversation, and I will be giving you a whole lesson on circularity. Circularity is another great concept. Seriously, it's an incredible concept. It can really happen, I promise. But Unfortunately, circularity, this great thing, is being adopted and distorted by big brands for, you guessed it, greenwashing purposes. So I'll be talking about that next week. We touched on it a little bit in today's conversation. You can find The Ore Foundation on Instagram at The Ore is Present, or you can visit theore.org. Don't worry, those links will be in the show notes. Please go follow The Ore Foundation. I... Hopefully you already do, but if you don't, this is important information to be receiving. I was telling Dustin that recording with Liz was super rad because I enjoy having these kinds of conversations and Liz is just so delightful. It was just so fun to talk to her, but I also felt kind of sick, like just a little nauseated the entire time as as I heard the details of the impact of all that barely worn, not very great clothing, as I pictured the tentacles of unwanted clothing in the ocean. I mean, that that is nauseating. It's, It's hard. It's hard to process all of this. If you're struggling, if you're grieving from hearing what we've talked about today, I get it. That's part of the process of moving forward, right? I, Amanda Lee McCarty, worked in that industry for a long time. I worried that if I didn't create stuff cheaply enough, fast enough, popular enough, that I would lose my job. Buying slash creating dumb future garbage clothes and accessories That was what stood between me and, well, homelessness. It was like all I had. I lost sleep over making my employer unhappy. And I lost sleep over thinking about the impact that making that employer happy was having on the planet and its people. Trust me, I was coping with both. And I didn't even know about tentacles of clothing, you know? 
it's a hard thing to reconcile. We're we're doing this together. And that's that's why I'm always reminding you that it's progress over perfection. We've made mistakes in the past. I've had so many clothes that I've barely worn and then sold at the Buffalo Exchange. I guess the silver lining is I rarely get invited to weddings, so at least a lot of them weren't like one-off outfits for weddings. I don't know. You make your own holidays when you don't get invited to weddings. I have created plenty of dumb reasons to buy something and wear it once over the past decade. But we're learning. We're doing better. We're changing our behavior. And we're educating those around us. I've said it before. I'll say it again. One person can't change the world alone. But when we all make these changes together... It makes a big impact on both the planet and the way companies do business. We're going to do this. I promise. Thanks for listening to this episode of Close Horse. Researched, written, edited, and hosted by me, Amanda Lee McCarty, with intense emotional support from Brenda. She's a cat. If you want to support my work here, please consider becoming a patron. I would love that. Find out more at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. And if you've enjoyed yourself today, please leave a rating and a review on Apple podcasts. And of course, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your neighbors, cats, whatever pets your neighbors have, tell them. Thanks as always to my other half, the one, the only Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. And for all the times He's tried to teach me keyboard shortcuts in Figma, and I totally forgot them as soon as he said them. Bye. (laughs) 